Slides or Brad's presentation? No, no, you're talking this thing. So that's, that's, um. No, no. All right, wait. I'm presenting Adam's slides. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Okay, presenting oh. slides, we'll do Adam's slides. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have to do Adam's voice. Yep. <laughs> 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 it seems like every year <laughs> it's Adam's voice. This is her appointment. It's all true. Yeah, it's just, well, you did it again. There's nothing. Else. I was requested <laughs> to bring lasers, so I did that. I also brought a multimeter just in case. <laughs> 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 this is what I There's a. Oh my gosh, this is. I was going to open this by saying that this is going to be a subject near and dear to my heart. I've changed my mind. <laughs> um, this, the title of this talk is Metamorphosis. This is the scary transformation of a mortal boy, who I assume is Dr. Johnston, into a superhuman physicist. And this is going to be the true story of Dr. Adam Englefield. <laughs> so, let's get right on the slides. Dr. Uh, Johnston, who does not mind telling us that he is a five slide channel. <laughs> so, let's have some respect for this. <laughs> Adam's early years were pretty much the blank to him. Uh, it's hard to say what he was doing during these years. None, nobody has been able to figure this out. Um, but this slide has been intentionally left blank. Now, these, these are his adolescent years. What does adolescent uh, go up to? Forty-six. Four years. Dr. Johnson's been drawing a blank. <laughs> and so, uh, well, let's see what happens. Later. <laughs> <laughs> when Alice was 34 years old, the undergraduate school, and uh, as you can see, he immediately started to study Greek because he wanted to go into studying the Greek language so that one day he could go to the Acropolis and do archaeology there. <laughs> so, he studied Greek. This is Adam's name. <laughs> Adam Inglefield. <laughs> and then, uh, Adam, because he, his adolescent years were so empty and blank, never learned to write his name, so he decided to sign his name with the, these glyphs to his for his father. <laughs> this is a picture of the young equal field. <laughs> he is staring intently at an object that he found on a trip to the Acropolis. <laughs> it's a tiny vial. And inside 
inside that tiny vial, there's something that came to play a very important part in Adam's later life. And I'll tell you about it on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever he got angry, it was amazing. When Adam turned angry, and this happens in graduate school, the first time you have to take your comprehensive exam. <laughs> this is Adam immediately after his comprehensive exam. He was not happy, and he got extremely, extremely upset. Tried to turn into the Incredible Hulk. But as so many things go in graduate school, it all went up in flames. <laughs> So this was a sad, this is perhaps a low point in Adam's, in Adam's life. <laughs> but um, he had to take inspiration from somewhere. <laughs> and, he found, and he found it on a trip he took. To the, <laughs> 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 to the land of the giants. <laughs> and there he found this giant. A person with a mustache we didn't recognize. You may notice that through time Adam's looks are subtly changing. <laughs> and so Adam sat down next to this giant. Uh, Jonathan Swift also wrote about these people, but uh, this is um, Adam's trip there. And uh, so <laughs> sometimes it's, it's the very simplest of concepts that can inspire one. <laughs> Bring something up from within. <laughs> so that other people can sort of know your, your deepest, your most innermost. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> and you can see that uh, that was a rousing success for Adam <laughs> and sent him onto the life that he has today in the physics department as our department quasi chair. <laughs> and do um, you have any questions at all <laughs> about the life of Dr. Adam Eagleville? <laughs> And this is my book, though. <laughs> this 
is about uh, PSL. Those of you who don't know what PSL is, I have no doubt that you will have no clear understanding of what it is after this talk. <laughs> now. Um, but let me try to get uh, some, of the, some of the pieces to you. So um, there are some numbers here, and then there are some numbers here. As we see, some of these numbers get bigger, these others may also get bigger <laughs> all the time. <laughs> So, it's a nice latte, and a little which is something I just made up now. It's kind of inspired by the idea of a coefficient in front of a pumpkin spice latte. Um, this, this, this PSL, if you will, is uh, this delectable high calorie count drink right here. And basically, our task is to figure out how to make the best PSL. There are various con uh, components to this. There is um, this stuff that comes from cows. <laughs> and then there's everything else. Um, in astronomy, we call these metals. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, this is a very simple recipe. It's all metals and nothing else. There's no hydrogen or helium. Um, except maybe in water, but that's, uh, we'll just, that's not important. <laughs> if we take that, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, I see. Yeah, this actually isn't very important. <laughs> Uh, so, but basically what it shows, and you know, for an advanced audience, um, they may be able to get this. This is way over your head. <laughs> this, is, this is not suitable for a general audience. Uh, right here, this is uh, a peak in the amount of, uh, of one of the metals. These come from supernova. <laughs> these come from planetary nebulas. And these right here, are extracted from uh, the faded, um, you know, unless we've crushed student souls. <laughs> this is the essential stuff that we look out of. This is critical to when we're creating this perfect coffee. Um, so supernovas, uh, what did we say here? Something else that's metal <laughs> that extracted. Thank you. I knew you could keep up with it. <laughs> well done. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is plot, this is slide six out of five. <laughs> you uh, are really interested in how to drive these kinds of things. Uh, you approximate. That means just dump a bunch of stuff together and hope that it layers here. You can leave this from left to right. You get a d by dt, and you continue over. But don't stop there. Keep going. <laughs> do it. And that's usually the mistake that people make. Is they end right there. And right there, you get this mix of slush. But if you keep going, you get this really nicely differentiated uh, fluid that allows you to eventually settle it down so that you can leave all the crummy milk at the bottom and just slurp out the metals at the top. <laughs> That's where it's really important. This is the stuff that you want. So, in summary, keep going all the way across. Don't get this mixing and make sure you get that separation so that you can have a good guys. In the end, what you want to do is this is really genius. Um, <laughs> on Tuesday, we'll be doing this free fall experiment where I'll be running around with this washing cup of coffee. We'll ask you to put your phone on the and <laughs> insulate it, and then um, that will keep my coffee warm, and then we'll drop the entire apparatus and see if coffee and phones all fall at exactly the same rate. Galileo said they would, but remember, these are really complicated metals right here. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going to happen that way. Um, so. <laughs>
our researchers say, why didn't you just use a lid? If you did, then it wouldn't be research. <laughs> so, thermometer, thermal insulator, and also spill protector to keep your metals inside of the cup. That's the lesson to be learned here. And um, I'll take any questions you may have. None? Good. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, finished in wine barrels. Cool. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, the drink I'm probably most familiar with is the red wine, which is Cabernet Sauvignon, I guess. So, if it's $8, I'll buy it. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, Bert, Bert Macklin, Spyglass Magazine. Um, <laughs> this is fascinating, uh, but I, I just have to ask because it's killing me. Who are you wearing? What's that? <laughs> who, who are you wearing? I mean, the. the well, if you, would, uh, if you would come to last year's, right, and had a uh, fashion and physicist. Oh, I wasn't at that. Oh, okay. This doesn't just happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Blue checks and the khakis, it doesn't just happen. Looks like it just happened. How does research contribute to a larger community of undead beings that want to ride horses and such? Right. Wolves and zombies and perhaps okay. ghosts. You want, there's two takeaways. <laughs> right. One, face this way. <laughs>
Those guys uh, were discovering that they could reanimate stuff. So it was animated, and then it was animated again. So it was reanimated. Uh, and so uh, Mary Shelley was thinking about that, and she was like, what can I do with this? Uh, I don't know. So off she went um, and wrote a story. And then Giovanni Aldini, who I've never heard of because his name doesn't begin with P, um, he uh, uh, inserted metal rods into this is disgusting. <laughs>
so that you try it, <laughs> right? Because you're not an experimentalist if you don't try it. Uh, and you go ahead and you stuff that into the human body, and what do you do? <laughs> you wind up creating a creature that rampages throughout the countryside and causes chaos nearly everywhere, and even more importantly, it's miserable. <laughs> so, as I said, graduate students. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could you write Mary, Mary? Could you spell Mary Shelley um, as if she was famous? So M A R Y P H S H E L L U. As with any good recipe, you, you always have to be able to make substitutions. Uh, in specific instance, are there any other good substitutions for lightning bolts? Bolts considering that they aren't always extremely common. Right. So one other thing that you can do, um, you may have heard that this is happening right now on the Pacific Rim. You can go set yourself next to an active volcano. <laughs> and that active volcano will often make its own lightning. So that makes it a lot more predictable. <laughs> and I tend to assign that to my graduate students. <laughs> Um, so for another energy source, nuclear bombs are about 10 to the 16 joules. Cool. Oh. Right on. So you could do, since it's 10 to the 16 joules, right? So what, what Dr. Arnold has pointed out is that if you drop a nuclear bomb on a graveyard, <laughs> we're delivering 10 to the 16 joules instead of 10 to the 10 joules, and that means we can reanimate a million corpses at once. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.